Hi, and welcome back to my videos for General Chemistry 1. In the past few videos, you've learned all about Lewis dot structures and what they mean. One of the main things we learn from them is the way the atoms in a molecule are connected to each other. As it turns out, knowing about the bonds in a molecule can help us understand why some chemical reactions are especially energetic, like reactions involving burning fuel. You learned in Chapter 5 that reactions like this are exothermic, so they give off a lot of energy, and the reason has to do with the bonds that are broken during the reaction. As you might expect, some chemical bonds are stronger than others, and it turns out we can make some pretty good predictions about what kinds of bonds are stronger than others. For example, you learned a few videos ago that if the difference between the electronegativities of two elements is large, as in sodium chloride, the bond between them is an ionic bond. It turns out that ionic bonds are much stronger than covalent bonds, and we can see that when we look at properties like the melting point. So, for example, the melting point of sodium chloride is 804 degrees Celsius. But on the other hand, the melting point of glucose, which contains only covalent bonds, is much lower, 148 degrees Celsius. This is because, unlike glucose, ionic compounds are connected by strong ionic bonds. We can also make predictions about the strengths of different covalent bonds. For example, as you'd probably guess, triple bonds are much stronger than double bonds, and double bonds are stronger than single bonds. Exactly how strong are these bonds? The strength of many different bonds is summarized in this table, which is also in Chapter 8 of your textbook. These are known as bond enthalpies, and the units here are kilojoules per mole. If you look carefully, you'll see that this table confirms some of the predictions we just mentioned. For example, you can see that a carbon-carbon single bond has a much lower enthalpy than a carbon-carbon double bond, and this in turn is lower than the enthalpy of a triple bond. We can use this data to help us get a good estimate of the enthalpy of a chemical reaction. For example, suppose we wanted to know the enthalpy of a combustion reaction, like that of methane, which is CH4. You might recall from Chapter 3 that in a combustion reaction, the second reactant is oxygen gas, and the products are carbon dioxide and water vapor. To find the enthalpy, we'll need to balance the reaction, so don't forget to do that. If you've forgotten how to balance a reaction, you might want to take a look at video number 6, where we first learned how to do that. Now is where Lewis dot structures come in handy. In order to predict the enthalpy, we want to know what bonds these molecules have, so we'll need to draw the Lewis structures. By now you know how to draw these. Here's a picture of the Lewis structures in this reaction. As it turns out, in almost all chemical reactions, we break some bonds in the reactants and form new bonds to get the products. In order to break the bonds, we have to put in energy, and when we form new bonds, it usually releases energy. That means we can calculate the approximate enthalpy of a reaction by using this formula. The change in enthalpy is approximately equal to the enthalpies of the bonds we break minus the enthalpies of the new bonds we form. For example, look at the combustion reaction of methane again. In this reaction, we break all the bonds in the reactants and form all the new bonds in the products. If we look up the enthalpies of all those bonds, we can plug them into the formula to find out the enthalpy of the whole reaction. So, let's look at the reactants first. The methane consists of four carbon-hydrogen single bonds and the oxygen consists of an oxygen-oxygen double bond. Don't forget that the coefficient in the balance reaction tells us that we have two oxygen molecules. So altogether, we're breaking four CH single bonds and two oxygen-oxygen double bonds. Meanwhile, on the product side, the carbon dioxide molecule has two carbon-oxygen double bonds and the water has two oxygen-hydrogen single bonds. There are two water molecules, so altogether we're forming two CO double bonds and four OH single bonds. If we use the chart of bond enthalpies, we can plug the data into our equation. When we do, here's what we get. Don't forget to multiply the enthalpies by the number of moles of each kind of bond. 
When we perform the calculation, we get a result of negative 808 kilojoules. So this is a very exothermic reaction. That's exactly what we'd expect for a combustion reaction. So how does this compare to reality? Well, we already know from chapter 5 how to accurately predict the enthalpy of a reaction. We talked about it back in video 17. What we do is use Appendix C of the textbook to find the enthalpy of formation for each compound in the reaction. We get the overall enthalpy of the reaction using this formula, the enthalpies of the products minus the enthalpies of the reactants. So let's try that for our reaction. In Appendix C, we can see that our first product, CO2, has an enthalpy of formation of negative 393.5 kilojoules. If we do this for all the products and reactants, here's what we get. Don't forget to multiply the enthalpies by the coefficients for the balanced reaction. When we perform the calculation, we get negative 802 kilojoules. That's pretty close to what we got using the bond enthalpies, which was negative 808 kilojoules. But why didn't we get exactly the same answer? To understand that, we just need to remember that the values in this chart are the average bond enthalpies. For example, the enthalpy of the CH single bond was calculated by looking at hundreds of different molecules that contain CH bonds and taking the average bond enthalpy for all of them. So that means all the values in this chart are approximations. On the other hand, the enthalpies in Appendix C aren't averages. Each one is the exact enthalpy for that particular compound. So the enthalpy you get by using Appendix C is much more accurate than the one that you get using bond enthalpies. Even so, as we saw earlier, the bond enthalpies still give a pretty good estimate. Well, that's all for now. You may have noticed that so far, we just looked at molecules containing covalent bonds. There's a different method for compounds with ionic bonds. We'll look at that next time, and that'll allow us to find out the energies of crystals like these beautiful gemstones. These are challenging calculations, but they allow us to work with some of the highest energy bonds that exist. So, until then, have a good week.